everybody and welcome to Falcon Play Xenonauts. And um, I'm really excited about this. Xenonauts is kind of a, um, almost a remake of sorts of the original XCOM game, so it shares a lot of similarities with that. Obviously, it doesn't have the rights to um, the XCOM, I guess, the licensing and everything like that. So there's going to be a lot of references to it, or like at least really stern similarities. But in its core, in its heart, it is essentially a remake of XCOM just with a little updated graphics and features and things to that degree. Uh, this is a game that's currently on early access right now, however, even though it's early access, it's been in development for quite a while now. So the game is, even though it's early access and there's updates here and there for like bug fixes, for the most part, it is a really refined game already, so it's pretty much set and done. The game is going to be ultimately released, at least the developers are saying, by May or something. It's going to be like the full-fledged release, even though I'm saying that. The game is just about completely playable as it is now, but by May is when they're pretty much saying that it's going to be the end point, we're going to be done with it, completely good to go, etc, etc. So I was actually able to hit up the developers for a, a copy of the game and they were kind enough to actually provide me with one, so thanks a lot for that. And hopefully I could do a little bit of fun with this game and hopefully um, I've had a lot of people request me to actually play this game, so I figure, hey, you know, why not? I need another game to kind of mess around with and uh, turn-based uh, strategy type games is really up my alley. And, um, you know, let's actually give it a try. So, um, without further ado, let's just get into the new game here. Since I am not a hardcore player of this just yet, I'm not sure. I've played this game a bit. I've gotten my feet wet with it. I'm still not completely too, I guess, uh, comfortable with it just yet. So we're going to roll with normal for that reason alone. However, I will turn on Iron Man mode on. If you're wondering about Iron Man mode, I'll highlight this over here. Uh, this mode forces the player to live with their mistakes, providing a more tension. If Iron Man mode is active, the player cannot manually save their game or load previous progress. Instead, the game autosaves after every major event and on game exit, overwriting the previous autosave each time. Once you have a few games under your belt, we recommend giving it a try. So saying after I have a few games under my belt, I have absolutely none. <laughs> so, um, you know, expect the worst, but hopefully we get the best out of this. So we're going to go in normal and Iron Man mode. I've done Iron Man mode in the XCOM games, at least the recent present ones that have come out, uh, Enemy Unknown and... Enemy Within, even though it's just an extension of Enemy Unknown. But either way, we're gonna go with Iron Man mode and normal, at least for now, maybe. Further on the line, if I feel more comfortable and we meet some disaster, we can move on to Veteran and whatnot, get a few more games under our belt, get a little bit more comfortable. But for now, we're doing normal in Iron Man mode, so let's go ahead and begin the game. Um, explanatory tooltip, Geoscape. So the Geoscape shows all the territory you are defending from invasion. Alien UFOs will periodically spawn on the map, damaging your relations with funding nations until they are shot down or complete their mission and disappear. You will shortly be asked to place your first base. The blue circle around it represents the range of the base radar, which automatically detects UFOs that pass inside it. Try to cover as much territory as possible with your first base. Once you have done this, you will have to speed up time until an event occurs. The arrow buttons along the top of the screen control the flow of time. So select the button with four arrows for maximum acceleration. The objective of the game is to shoot down alien craft and capture artifacts from the crash site. Then research them to unlock new technology and learn more about the alien threat. Eventually, you will learn enough about them to defeat them once and for all. So again, if you are familiar with the old XCOM games or even the new ones, it's basically the same gist of it. You will have random UFOs that come by occasionally. You will have the option to knock them down, shoot them down, etc., etc., intersect them. It's going to be alien, uh, I guess, uh, not only invasions, but actual alien kidnappings and things to that degree. So it's basically your priority to kind of keep the, the world safe. And, you know, again, this is, uh, this is going to be taking place in 1979, so the USSR, the Soviet Union, is running strong and firm, so because of that reason alone, I'm going to actually be going with the Soviet Union, uh, select primary base location, so we're going to be rocking over here for sure. And yeah, we're going to be pick picking the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, basically, this is my way of, even though this is in the past and you know, the tensions are pretty high with the Cold War and everything going on, this is my way of kind of uh, extending my hand of... Uh, I guess uh, telling Vladimir Putin and Barack Obama is why can't we just why can't we just be friends, man? End this petty, uh, I guess, like uh, control for the world and you know um, rights and wrongs and yada yada yada, man. Nothing brings a country together or at least uh, a world together like alien invasions. I mean, just ask Will Smith and uh, Independence Day, right? Welcome to Earth, bitch. So either way, we're gonna go with the Soviet Union. Um, this episode is gonna be really slow. It's gonna really just focus on the basics and the uh, I guess base management of the game. Next episode we'll probably go into an actual mission and start doing our thing, but for now, right now is going to be kind of an introduction to the series itself. I'm going to mess around with some base management and um, things to that degree. There's the one cool thing about this game, which uh, let me get in, well I'll do this soon enough, but 
what I want to focus on right now is this. Um, I do have the option of going into our barracks here somewhere along this place. There we go. And I can rename soldiers. So much like we do with, um, you know, RimWorld and anything like that. I'm going to name this guy as Haybro for now. Sergeant Haybro. Um, we're going to have uh, right now eight people to kind of rename first and foremost. So as you can imagine, I'm going to make this uh, capable for anybody to join. So uh, the only thing you got to keep in mind, and unlike RimWorld, there's going to be a lot more frequent deaths here just because we're rocking Iron Man for one. And number two, it's something I'm not too familiar with just yet. So there's going to be a lot of unfortunate deaths, a lot of me testing the grounds and kind of getting my feet wet. So expect a lot of deaths. So definitely start pouring in your uh, names in the comments, guys. Whoever wants to be renamed as a soldier, go let me know. I'm not going to do this as a, um, hey, Falcon, can I be this guy and this class and yada, yada, yada. We'll probably do that down the line. For now, I kind of want to test how this is going to work. So for now, let me know. We're going to go by a first come, first serve basis. I'm going to just name you down the line, whether you're female, male, black, Hispanic, Asian, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just going to put your name into one of the available soldiers, and that's pretty much it. Kind of like how we do in Room World anyway. So um, further down the line, we might actually experiment with classes per request and things to that degree. But we're going to keep it simple for the first time around. And just basically, whoever asks me a name, boom, you're first on the list. Boom, I'll just rename you and there we go. So that's what's really cool about this. So it's going to give us a little option to get you guys involved as well with this. Um, so for now, we're going to start doing some base management first and foremost, which is basically what I wanted to start off with here. Um, right now, we have our Charlie uh, helicopter. This is basically... What I'm highlighting, right? Well, not highlighting, but at least hovering over, is going to be the aircraft that takes your soldiers from your base or any other base that you eventually erect. <laughs> not that type of erection. Um, around the world, as uh, to basically go and either, uh, uh, I guess, mainstay a kidnapping from happening, or when you shoot down a UFO, actually send your soldiers from whatever base to that uh, area altogether. Um, these guys over here are aircrafts. These are the ones we're going to be using to shoot down UFOs. Um, these are the basic startup ones, so we'll be able to upgrade these to better planes down the line, I'm sure. And not only that, but weapons and etc, etc. Over here, we actually have a uh, space for one more Condor or another uh, helicopter. But again, we don't need that just yet. This over here, I do believe, is the... what is that? Living Quarters is going to be down over here. So we're going to... the first thing I like to do, first and foremost, at least what what limited gameplay I have is in order to expand uh, how many soldiers and scientists we have in our base. I like to expand the living quarters just for that. So the first thing I'm going to do is get a living quarter area. We're going to rotate this and let's keep the living quarters together. So that's going to be right there. And this is telling us that in five days time, this is going to be completely built for us. So let's keep that in mind. The other thing that we have is the Raider Array, which is over here. This I'm not too particularly sure what it's for yet, but I'd imagine if I could use some common sense for one, which is kind of really, uh, it's <laughs> something new to me, unfortunately, because if you've you know, seen my gameplay of other games altogether, is that um, it's going to be used in order to be able to track UFOs a bit easier around the area and stuff to that degree. So right now we're going to rock with, I guess we could do another one, right? So let's do another Raider Array and have it hook up. Well, let's have them together. I don't want to spread them out too much. So let's have another Raider Array. This will be ready in 10 days. Again, all this I'm building, right? But it does co come with a monetary value. So I can't just, you know, put shit up left and right and be like, yeah, we're good. No, we all have a certain funding. You start off with a million. I'm down to 850 after having uh, these two guys set for building, for building, I should say. Um, storerooms is going to be basically to store weapons, any sort of alien artifacts, etc., etc. Right now we have one. Um, we're going to roll with one for now and not go crazy just yet with spending too much. Uh, laboratory, obviously, is going to be this guy over here. And it's going to be where you, I guess, uh, do your autopsies, your... Um, other technology advances and researches, etc. So basically where the scientists do their thing, right? Uh, the workshop, if I have to guess, the workshop is going to be basically uh, XCOM's version of where you kind of build uh, new weapons and things like that. So you research them in the laboratory, but then you have to go actually and build them, which is what the workshop I'm going to assume is for. Again, uh, this is something I should have probably researched a bit more in depth, but we're going to do this by the hip and stuff. Just kind of shoot by the hip and hopefully assume that I'm not too I'm completely wrong here. If I am wrong, though, I'm sure that many of you guys will let me know. And either way, uh, medical center we don't have. And I think that's actually pretty important. So the medical center, I could only imagine, actually works as a way to kind of heal your soldiers a lot faster because when they're in battle, they will uh, take damage, and when they take damage, they will be injured for a few days. Uh, 
if they die, obviously you're not gonna return them anymore. They're not fucking zombies. But if they're dead, they're dead. But if they get injured, like take a straight bullet or they're bleeding in the battlefield and you actually win the assault without them dying, they will be injured for a few days and they're not gonna be able to, you're not gonna be able to use them in the actual mission. So medical center, I assume is gonna be good for um, speeding up that process. So let's set up the medical center next to the living quarters right here. And the garage is gonna be, I imagine, what is the garage for? Probably for your vehicles. You're going to be able to build vehicles. So, um, for that alone, I assume we should probably get one of them so we can start building some vehicles soon enough. Like, the vehicles work as the actual assault vehicles in battle. So, they're actually pretty good for maybe tanking some shots and, like, you know, getting some, uh, good sight on your surroundings because uh, the game is really focused on you being able to see the aliens. It's really methodical when it comes to that. You don't want to just rush all your guys out and about. You kind of want to keep a squadron of sorts, but at the same time you want to have somebody to kind of get vision on enemies before you actually move forward and, you know, scout the area. So because of that, let me build a garage. Um, I'd imagine next to the aircraft seems pretty good. And that's going to be good for now. Missile battery, this I could honestly tell you I'm not completely sure what it does. Other than maybe produce missiles for our fighter jets, perhaps? Um, so for now, I'm not going to build one. And hopefully, I'm not making a big mistake here. But um, that's pretty much the gist of the base management portion right here. So we're going to get these guys up and going. They'll be the ones that will be uh, built soon enough. Now, when we go to research, this is where you actually research the stuff. So once you acquire certain um, alien artifacts and weapons, you can research them in order for the workshop to actually build them and use it against the aliens and whatnot. Right now you start off with 10 scientists, we're going to be hiring a few more because I like to keep a few extra scientists so we can research stuff a bit more faster. So we'll keep that in mind right now. We could actually hire a few and living space available, we have 5 more spots, right? So let's actually take this time to make uh, 5 more scientists. Now I could, essentially, this is actually going to intervene with our hiring of recruits, of actual army men. Now the thing here is that, you know, you kind of have to mix it up a bit, like you got to make sure that you have enough soldiers. I guess in reserve, in case my main guys go injured for a few days as I've said before. But I'm gonna play it on the side of technology for this one and actually just hire five scientists. Hire scientists, there we go. So we're gonna have a few of these guys, they're not gonna be here immediately. It takes a few uh, a few days as well for them to actually come into the board and to the base and everything like that. So keep that in mind. Over here the workshop is basically where we will be able to make some soldier weapons, armors, etc, etc. But we can't do any of this. We could also hire engineers by the way. Oh, I can actually... No, I can't, because we don't have the living quarters available to us. So, that's the reason why I made an extra living quarter, so that we have more room to actually have people in our base. Because even though our workshop could uh, use 10 more people, I still don't have a place for them to actually live in, so we got to keep that in mind. So that's the reason why I'm building the living quarters to get more space. And over here, tell us the roster, our barracks, our soldiers and whatnot. Uh, my dude, I even named Hey Bro, is right there. And this will tell you basically what role they're going to be playing. We're going to switch up a lot of these, by the way. And we have two people on reserve right now. We have Salvatore Ricci and Alan Miller, unassigned. They're not part of the um, Charlie helicopter that goes out about do our things for us just yet, but they will be at some point or another, especially when one of our guys takes a wound and he's out for a few days. What do we have over here? We have the storeroom, and this is where basically, um, there's nothing in the stores at this base that you need to worry about, Commander. Food, fuel, munitions, local forces supply, all that to us for free. And I make sure it gets to where it needs to be. The moment we have any manufactured equipment or captured technology, you'll be able to manage it here. So this is basically our storeroom where we manage our own stuff. And over here is going to be the actual soldiers. And this is where you equip them, unequip them, switch their classes and whatnot. So I'll definitely be playing with this before we call it an episode here today. Vehicles is basically what I mentioned about the garage room. Um, you'll be able to build vehicles to kind of go help you out in the battlefield. And this right here is basically to deck out your um, condors, your aircrafts. You can only deck out, to my knowledge, the interceptor. And I can actually do that same with the dropships. What the, you do with the dropship is you can actually maneuver. Like, you know, the dropship, for instance, has the big exit in the back, but it has two side doors as well. So I could probably even move this guy over here if I felt like it. But, you know, again, we're going to mess around with that later. And then this will be a Xenopedia. This will be really useful for us in terms of giving us um, statistics and actual information about certain things. Autocannon, sidewanders, extraterrestrials, etc., etc. So basically, the main story of Xenonauts to this degree is that what happened was what sparked everything was the Iceland incident. Um, I suppose that for flavor text I should probably read this out just so that um, you have an idea what the hell we're doing here. And let's go ahead and do that. Let's take a little while and read this out. Again, it's gonna be a really slow episode guys. Don't expect any missions here today. But I'm trying to give you an idea as to what we're gonna be doing and give you the runabout of Xenonauts. Next episode will be the first mission and everything like that. So hopefully you stick around at least to kind of figure out what we're doing. And again, 
I'm also going to be taking names to rename, so be sure to keep that in mind. Um, Iceland Incident. Uh, 1958 Iceland Incident was our first contact with extraterrestrial life. An alien craft entered our atmosphere above the Atlantic in what we now believe was a scouting mission. It was detected and intercepted by NATO jets under the assumption it was an experimental Soviet aircraft. Uh, visual sightings of the UFO rapidly spelled that myth. The craft was far larger than its radar signature suggested, more akin to an airborne warship than an aircraft. Attempts to communicate elicited a barrage of energy weapon fire that disintegrated half of the squadron and left the remaining jets slimping back to base with severe damage. Several subsequent attempts that were made by NATO fighter squadrons to intercept the alien vessel, costing them a number of aircrafts but inflicting no appreciable damage on the target. When the UFO abruptly changed course and began heading to the eastern coast of the United States, the decision was made to deploy nuclear weapons. Of course, right? The US freaks out, it's kind of like, oh, they're coming over here and nuke it, nuke it away. I'm not necessarily being anti-American about that. I'm American, I'm allowed to make comments like that, right? <laughs> 20 minutes later, half a dozen nuclear-tipped ICBM ignited the sky above an unanimated part of Iceland. Astonishingly, the UFO survived the blast, but it crash-landed almost intact shortly afterwards. At this point, the NATO forces made the decision to inform their Soviet counterparts about the alien vessel and seek their assistance in securing the vessel and the technology within. This decision was seemingly motivated more by self-preservation rather than altruism. The Soviets were furious at the large, uh, furious at the large unexplained nuclear detonation and were apparently close to launching missiles of their own. So again, this is around the Cold uh, War area era, I should say, and um, you know, I don't think they were too crazy about nuclear uh, missiles going set off and whatnot, but you know. Unfortunately, there was a crazy UFO aircraft heading to the U.S. and, you know, had to be done. But again, uh, the nuclear-tipped uh, missiles were only able to bring the aircraft down, not actually disintegrate it, so that's pretty fucking impressive. A joint ground operation was launched to capture the alien craft, but numerous extraterrestrials had survived the crash and put off stiff resistance. Human forces took significant losses during the operation, but slowly secured the area around the craft. What happened next is uncertain. All we know is that an alien craft was destroyed in an enormous explosion, almost certainly caused by the craft's power source. This explosion annihilated the UFO itself and wiped out all the ground forces within a 10 mile radius. The only survivors were those of the distant command post. There was nothing left, the UFO was gone, and only a handful of those who had sighted an extraterrestrial were left alive. The aftermath of the incident involved a large-scale cover-up. The official explanation was that of a Soviet invasion of Iceland, thwarted by nuclear weapons with heavy losses on both sides. But behind closed doors, the two superpowers were collaborating. A joint black ops organization was formed, drawing from the resources of both, unofficially dubbed the Xenonauts, not XCOM, but the Xenonauts. It was tasked with defending the planet against alien invasion. The absence of an uh, obvious alien threat was made us look rather irrelevant for the past 20 years, Commander. But we had little doubt that we would be needed someday. It seems that day has come. So basically, this happened, was it 1959? Yeah, 1958, 59. So roughly 20 years later is basically when, even though the uh, Xenonauts project got, I guess, uh, affirmed and, you know, went uh, underground and started doing their thing, 20 years later is when the UFOs were like, fuck that, we're coming in here to stay now. And suddenly our uh, little uh, Black Ops project is no longer Black Ops and it's basically just the fight for humanity to survive. So again, nothing brings the world together like alien invasion. At least that's what Hollywood's thought. So that's a little bit of background of Ice of the incident itself. And there's a few other things for us to check out. Ballistic weapons, you know, not armor, basic armor. Uh, I, I could imagine that we're going to be able to upgrade this armor because I don't really feel too comfortable sending my soldiers out there and just, you know, their fucking blue rag uh, outfits from, uh, you know, what is this like? The first week of like, you know, combat training and stuff where you're not even doing like actual heavy combat training, but just like, you know, minimal stuff, so <laughs> we're gonna definitely have to upgrade that in order for these guys to survive, take a few more hits, etc, etc. But for now, let's go into the barracks himself, the soldier equipment, actually switch a few classes around. Uh, my first time uh, try with this game, I pretty much got almost annihilated because number one, I wasn't being very cautious about my movements, and secondly, um, I just kind of went ahead with the default classes, and there's gonna be a few other classes you can switch to that the game doesn't initially let you, or it lets you, but doesn't give you the idea that it's there, so for instance, you have the assault weapon, which is basically your kind of heavy duty guy, not necessarily your heavy weapons guy. This is in Team Fortress 2. There is a heavy weapons class, but the assault class kind of rocks the shotguns, so they're really good for up close and personal boom, shotty to the face type of thing. So I would definitely want to keep one of those around. The other thing you want to kind of really pay attention to here is accuracy and strength. These are the other things you got to kind of focus on, but I like to. Reflexes probably works in terms of dodging. Bravery, um, if I'm gonna assume anything, it's because bravery is there, like, whenever a soldier goes down, 
your guys could have mental breaks, kind of like an XCOM where they start freaking out when somebody dies or they take like a shot. So uh, bravery is going to probably um, work to, I guess, thwart that um, debuff from happening. But strength is basically used in order to how much you're going to be able to carry without actually without it actually affecting your movements. So right now this guy has like 68 TUs, which is basically uh, timed units, I believe, which lets you move a certain amount of spaces, lets you crouch, lets you rotate around to get better views and whatnot. So you don't want that interfering too much. You kind of want to have a high TU because obviously that's also going to affect how many shots you get off in a turn. So right now, Assault, um, what I like to do is I do like to keep snipers. I like to rock with two snipers as a matter of fact. That's kind of like my XCOM play coming into effect here. And my sniper is at 66 accuracy. Okay. Is there anybody better than that? Is the first thing we should probably start looking at here. Accuracy 63, 60, 58. So it seems that Katrina Lebedeva, 63, is actually pretty good accuracy. However, she does have a high strength, meaning I probably would want to give her something that holds a lot of items. So I'll, I'll bypass her for now. And... Because of the low strength, I'm going to say that Sergeant Hey Bro, <laughs> by the way, this name is only, uh, uh, I guess a placekeeper. I'm going to rename this to one of you guys, so keep that in mind. So I'm going to make this guy a sniper, though, because he has a decent accuracy. His strength's pretty low, so I think it kind of works out. So let me change the role over to sniper for this guy. Alrighty, and once you do that, it'll automatically equip what um, weapons go with that default class or the default equipment for it. Right now we got the primary weapons for this guy, so that's all good and all, but I do want to add a few more items here if we can. So he's going to be able to have the gun, the regular pistol in his belt, along with a few clips. He's going to have a med pack as well for any healing situation. Now, because he is a sniper, he's going to kind of lay back, so he's not going to be doing too much of much. So rockets, we don't need that. Um, We don't need any of that, I don't think. And grenades, hmm... I honestly don't think I see this guy going up front. What I will do is give him a smoke grenade. Now, what the smoke grenade does... <clears throat> is this going to affect him? Oh, uh, no. 68 TU. Okay. So let me give him, like, three of these guys. Okay, that's actually going to drop down. So as you can see over here, we were at 68 without it, right? Timed units. When I added this extra one, it dropped me down to 65, which is what you don't want happening. So I think two smoke grenades are good enough. And what they do is... Actually, let's read it. <laughs> The smoke grenade does not cause damage, instead generating a cloud of thick smoke within a blast radius. This smoke significantly reduces the accuracy of any shots fired through it, offering instant protection from incoming alien fire. Any unit that enters or begins a turn in smoke title will suffer a small amount of stun damage as a result. Grenades can be thrown from the hand or can be thrown from the backpack using the grenade quick slot in the combat UI. This costs more to use than a grenade was already in the soldier's hand, and still more if the soldier does not have an empty hand. So. <clears throat> It does take a bit more if you're going to be rocking them from the backpack. But what I what I think about the smoke grenade is because um, it's going to be good for covering our guys out in the field and smoke grenades. So when aliens are kind of shooting into us, we could lay off a smoke grenade and then they're going to take a penalty to the shot heading towards us. Obviously, it's going to also affect us. But if you're looking for like a quick way around, like say there's not enough cover or you can't get a guy behind cover, you could always set off a smoke grenade and basically kind of keep them a little bit safer than they would just out in the open. So that's the reason why I do want to rock a few grenades on this guy. Um, and our, our second sniper, might as well do the same thing with her. I don't see any other reason to give him anything else but that. So let me go ahead and... Um, well, this one could even rock up to four. So let's just do four. I think the fifth one's going to probably... No. I think this is a little excessive amount to be quite honest with you, but uh, let's just do three. And we could do a flashbang. The flashbang, what this does is actually stuns enemies. It doesn't hurt them, but it stuns them a bit. So it kind of puts them under the, um, what is it, the under attack thing. So it lets it get, it makes it limited how many timed units they have, in turn, like in aliens, I should say. Uh, how many moves they can make after being uh, hit with a flashbang, and it also disorients them a bit. So that's the reason why that's actually pretty good. But I don't see our sniper getting too close to actually set one of those off. But... Just because we have the ability to, because it's not affecting our time use, I'll add one just as an in case. Never know. Alright, so Assault, we do want to keep a, at least one Assault. I'm not too crazy about this class, but um, I do want to keep at least one just for the namesake of it. Um, For this guy, accuracy is pretty low, which is kind of works out since he has a shotgun. You're going to be up and close and personal anyway, so I don't think you have to have that crazy of accuracy. Um, Health is 70, which is actually really good because there is a class that really relies on taking nothing but hits. So you know what? I'm going to probably make this guy um, our shield guy. Change role. 
and put a shield. Now what this class does essentially, it's really good if you're gonna be opening doors, opening um, UFO aircrafts, and you wanna put them in the front line so that when they're getting shot at, um, they take the brunt of the damage, and because they have the shield, they do get a buff too in terms of damage, in terms, they take less damage, and or have a higher chance of evading because of the shield thing itself. So we definitely want to keep one of those at least when we start, uh, I guess, uh, breaching UFO aircraft. So let's keep a shield uh, for sure for this one. And I think this works out for the most part. Now this class, um, he has 52 time units. We might be able to even put in a grenade in here, I hope. Definitely can. Uh, let me do two grenades, is that possible? It is. And maybe even another flashbang. Alright, excellent. And just in case, if, it do, if it's not going to hurt us too much, let me put a med kit and it's going to drop us to 50. So let me get rid of a flashbang and we're up to 52. Alright, good. I like to keep everybody with a med kit just because I have a really kind of uh, wild mainstay of play. Where I'm kind of really like... I send all my guys out there in the middle of the thick of things. I don't plan things out too well. So <laughs> I'm, I, I want to give med kits to everybody to make sure they're able to heal themselves and whatnot. A uh, rifleman is basically your basic class. You know, they're a jack of all trades sort of thing. We do want to keep a few of those guys involved. So we have a shield. Uh, we do need to get an, a new assault person though, because we did lose our assault person by switching Ryan Quinn over to shield. So let's say we do um, primary weapon. Da, ba, ba, ba. All right, how about we do? This is our heavy weapons dude over here. Strength's gonna be high on this one, so I want to keep that. Oh, we also need a rocketeer, by the way. Um, rocketeer requires some strength, so I might switch uh, Katarina over to. Our Rocketeer, to be quite honest with you. And that's what we're going to do. So, Katharina, let me switch you over to Rocketeer. Rocketeer, as you can imagine, kind of a high damage, high potential type of class. The thing with them is that they're limited to just the missiles that they have in their backpack. So, she only has four shots. The other thing is that even though they cause high damage and cover a big radius, is that they also destroy artifacts and stuff because, you know, it's kind of like throwing a grenade, for instance. It's going to ruin what you're trying to collect. So that's the reason why you kind of have to pick your spots with the Rocketeer. But on occasion, if it comes down to either salvaging an artifact or potentially saving a recruit's life, we're going to have to definitely go with the saving a recruit's life. So that's why I, I want to keep one of these persons around. Um, 68 TUs, that's actually pretty good. Uh, I won't be able to put a med pack in here because it's too big for her. But I could probably even put a clay... What is this? The C4, right? Yeah, C4 charge. It's a block of plastic explosive. Basically, you could put this on walls and disintegrate areas and whatnot to get better access to areas and stuff like that. So, we definitely want to give her that. And maybe if we can, perhaps, big maybe, yeah, we could add a grenade in there too. All right, so let's just add one grenade and we'll keep the C4 in her just in case. And let's see, our shield, dude, I would like to get a, a fucking uh, C4 on our shield, dude. All right, let me drop one of these grenades and how about that? All right, good. So that'll work out. Give him a C4 as well because since he's a shield guy, he's going to be up front and personal. I could probably put C4s with him as well and kind of give us access to areas. So Rocketeer, good. Now Rifleman, we have two Rifleman, three Rifleman, four Rifleman. All right, so we have two snipers, a shield, a Rocketeer. We have four Rifleman now to kind of mess around with. What I like to also do is have a scout. I'm not sure how prevalent of a class this is, but... I like to think of the scout as a person I could kind of send out and kind of get a vision on enemies for us. So, um, let's see. Who would work out for somebody with high reflexes, I would imagine, right? Unfortunately, none of these guys really excel. Oh, I guess Allison Harvey has kind of, uh, worked her way into being a scout for us. So let me go ahead and do scout. We still need to put one more heavy weapons guy in here, by the way, or one heavy weapons guy. So I've got to figure out which one of the remaining guys is going to be good for that. So Allison Harvey's going to be our scout. She only rocks a primary weapon, a uh, pistol, has a grenade and whatnot. So she's really, they're really good for capable of that. In her backpack, they have sniper rifles as well. So they can kind of switch on the fly, which is what's really cool about this class. And because she's a scout, I'd imagine she could also work well with some smoke grenades just to give her a little bit extra coverage. Can I get two of them in there? I can't. So let's go with two of those, and overall this seems alright for me. And then we got three Riflemen left, one of them has to be our heavy weapons dude. So Riflemen, accuracy 52, 60. Okay, so I'm gonna make um, Steve Robertson our heavy weapons dude. And um, the reason why is because he has less accuracy, which could be a downside to it, but at the same time, since you're just kind of spraying crazy one of those Rambo guns, you might have a better chance. So let's switch you over to heavy weapons. There you go. Uh, he doesn't have that much strength though, so he's taking quite a big of an impact in his, uh, 
TU's right there. So he's down to 61 because of that. Is that really good? Not particularly. We might want to switch that idea out. Maybe make Arthur Kuchima the heavy weapons dude. Let me try Arthur Kuchima as our heavy weapons guy and see how this works out for us. 55 TU, huh? 61. You know what? Fuck it. Let's just keep uh, Steve Robertson as our guy. And Kuchima is going to stay as a rifleman. I do want to keep some riflemen because they're kind of like the jack of all trades. So they're kind of good for a lot of stuff. So I'll keep him as our dude. Heavy weapon's going to be over here. Um, if I add this and it drops down even more, huh? So, alright, we're gonna roll with this. I would like to get a med pack on him too, but... Yeah, it's gonna drop us down six. That's not really worth it. So, Rifleman's gonna hang out over here. Two Riflemans, okay. Um, let's go ahead and think if we could probably give these guys a grenade or so. That would be pretty good. Let's give them this and give them a flashbang as well. Give them one more grenade over here. Alright, that'll work out pretty well. And then, Igor Popov. Let's do the same thing, a grenade right there, some of that, two grenades, alrighty, that's good. That'll work out to me from my knowledge. So, for the most part, I think we have everybody set up pretty well. Let me go back into the geoscape over here, and our first thing's gonna be to complete the alien research, which is already pretty much underway in our research facility down over here. So, obviously, alien invasion, we have 10 scientists working on it, the progress is excellent. Basically, this will tell you how fast they'll be able to finish something. So you want to keep it as good or excellent. If you're rocking poor, then it means it's going to take a longer time to actually complete that research. So there you go. That's pretty much the base management option I wanted to get done with. There's going to be more of it in the future. Um, let me know if you guys want to see a lot of this. If not, I'll you know knock it down a bit too. But again, I want to give you the whole scape of the whole game altogether without you know detecting too much and just making it battle after battle and whatnot. So alrighty, what we could do now is actually set ourselves up to start speeding up time. And hopefully, there we go, UFO detected already. And what we could do is um, intercept and that's exactly what we're going to be doing. But we're going to be doing that next episode. So for now, what I'm going to do, guys, I'm, uh, I'm going to not record any more Xenonauts for this day. I'm going to release this episode and I will want you guys to give me comments what you want to see in this series. Um, if you're interested in being renamed as a soldier, let me know and I'll put you on the list and we'll rename you as so. Etc, etc. So... Let's make this an introductory episode where we took nothing but actually looking at the base management option of the game. The battle option is going to be a lot more fun once we're in battle. But again, I wanted to give you a really good interesting feel as to what goes on in the base management option. So let me know your comments, how you feel about this, you want to see this as a series or not. And again, also, if you're interested, drop your name in the hat and I'll basically rename soldiers after you. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this and as the first episode of a series, I really do encourage you to please click that thumbs up button. The support really does mean a lot. If you did enjoy the video, that is, go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If not, perfectly fine. No reason not to. Um, but either way, hopefully you enjoyed it and I will catch you next time.